गुड मॉर्निंग मैम हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग ओके यू बीन वेटिंग क्वेश्चन what do you think by like you know of the phrase ethics in public administration what are you going to expect from this chapter some standard or principle to be followed in administration like uh, public service and delivery or in whatever is required in administration yeah so you are saying a set of norms for administration yes ma'am why do you think administration needs a different set of norms because like we discussed means i yesterday i saw video, that video of our test discipline or discipline or else we can say Uh, a set of principle or norm to run a system efficiently system is there but if you want to run it efficiently then we need some guidelines or norms so that it can do better service okay so it's about efficiency is it like to to run it efficiently many things are involved like efficiency and mm. for uh, facilitation purpose mm. and uh, like um, management related things more more managerial uh, skills okay any other ideas on why we need a new set of principles for public administration uh, i think for public administration uh, the difference is Uh, the beneficiaries are that spectrum is very huge. Like you have to, you are dealing with a lot of people, and you have a lot of power to uh, actually uh, benefit them. So unlike other jobs, I think you would really need a code because of this. Otherwise, like any other job, other values are similar. I think your values need to be stronger than other jobs because of the uh, spectrum of people that you are benefiting and the kind of power that you hold. sort of yeah and any other ideas uh, i just need to tell something as you have not uh, sent the discipline question you said you would share that somebody has written you have not shared that oh okay yeah yeah i think i only shared the side boxes one is it yeah yeah only side okay. boxes yeah. ah sure sure i'll i'll share any other principles or reasons why we need a different set of ethics for public administration okay so unlike most other jobs uh, which are often seen as jobs public administration is still a service right so on one hand you are just a job where you uh, like uh, shubhankar pointed out where you have an elaborate system where which needs rules which needs proper mechanisms and which needs efficiency to deliver uh, all the mandates that are part of the job the other hand yeah anjana i think other jobs you need to do what the organization wants you to do and in this job you need to do what the people or the beneficiary want you to do so that's again different that is also yeah like i mean even in business you need to do what your beneficiaries want you to do isn't it 
like your your organization itself is a yeah sure little difference of private interest and public interest yes so so that's the larger interest right so that's the like that's the larger difference between a job and service that is like here these are mostly uh jobs which are uh you know just fitting your need like your personal need or private need but here this service is aligned to uphold public interest so how is this public interest defined the principles of public interest are set in the constitution itself and then they are enforced through various laws and regulations so when we speak of public administration it is guided not by any profit it is not guided by its selfish interest so there is nothing that public administration is achieving so if you just imagine any organization serving people let's say atel serving people so atel has something at stake atel is benefiting in return for its service but if you look at public administration it is a humongous organization unlike atel and it it serves crores of people across the country and it gains nothing in return so it only collects taxes and why does it collect taxes again to serve you efficiently so the only motto that guides public administration is service and public interest the principles of which are defined by the constitution and the procedures or the mandate of which are set by laws and regulations of the country so a public administrator's duty is to largely uphold these rules laws and regulations and deliver public interest within the confines of rules and laws as far as possible so how you deal with ethical dilemmas is the next thing we'll go to that step later but the service that public administrator delivers has to be within the confines of law now previously our public administration if you look at if you just look at the evolution of public administration any kingdom can you recollect any kingdom which had elaborate administration maurya maurya maurians maurians so maurians had elaborate administration why do you think they got elaborate administration because it was huge to be administer there were lot many people and lot yes. many functionaries yes so huge so many functions people maurian kingdom also imposed taxes so because it was huge it needed an army to control all the boundaries and because it needed an army it needed taxes because it needed taxes it needed administration and to manage all these people it needs to decentralize that administration and break down that administration into various segments so that's what happened in mauryan uh, kingdom it was largely centralized mainly for tax collection uh of course though kautilya says that the happiness of people is happiness of king they did not take many steps for like literal happiness uh it was largely a kingdom of that times so he the king ruled as a king only not as a servant of people so but the spirit of welfare was present but as we moved into a medieval period we've got one more huge kingdom and administration moguls so mughal administration also was much more elaborate than mauryas they had separate departments they had even elaborate public administration so as your kingdom grows in size and as the needs of your kingdom increases you need elaborate administration uh how does administration serve kingdom apart from just collecting taxes and enforcing order if you just imagine king sitting somewhere in delhi and you have last mile people in villages how do these people feel the spirit of king like that we are ruled by akbar how do someone in rural rajasthan feel what is happening in delhi 
they can't go to delhi darbar how would they feel the king's presence it happens through administration so a collector like or this uh, you know revenue persons or the police these are people who enforce the order of the king at the grassroots level so for people to keep up the spirit of the kingdom and to imagine the presence of a king there needs to be a grassroots level administration so that's how public administration serves not just uh, tangibly through taxes and order it also helps intangibly by keeping up the psyche of people and enforcing the mandate of the king at grassroots level so as uh, british have so even mughals were never uh, intending to harm indian public so even they were largely aimed at their administration was largely aimed at collecting taxes maybe constructing irrigation departments uh, collecting uh, you know revenue agri revenue giving loans so they had an administration which is very elaborate but was largely aimed at uh, protecting and taking care of indian society it was never harm intending but as we move to the later administration when actually administration became more formal and technical under british rule so under british india got its first modern civil services so modern because they are now appointed they like formal written communication uh there are a set of rules and principles for civil services which are written down these people have to write an exam and you know through the exam get into civil services unlike british and uh, sorry unlike mauryan and mughals when appointments were largely spoils you know king appoints but british uh, introduced modern civil services so meritorious appointments meritorious transfers a set of rules and regulations which are drafted and then there is apart from the usual tendency of mauryan and mughals to just take care of administration the intent of british civil services is also to uphold british interests in india it's quite surprising so this is not to uphold indian interests as you know as it is during mauryas and during mughals this is to uphold the interest of british colonial economy in india so what is the interest of british colonial economy to gain at the profit of the india yeah how through taking uh, raw material from here and manufacturing there and giving the finished product here yeah so in effect india has become a net exporter net of exporter. raw material net importer of finished goods so we lost so much forex so we lost all our money so british were responsible for sorry the british civil services were responsible for collecting taxes enforcing agri revenue this permanent settlement tahsildari zamindari so whichever revenue mechanism the british came up civil services were responsible for enforcing them on ground for penalizing people for not paying them and also for suppressing indian rebellion so whenever you come up with uh, a protest a local civil rebellion or a peasant rebellion it is the british civil servants who were standing at the forefront uh, you know these collectors acting as spies passing on the information to british so they used to suppress indian voices and largely uphold british interests so it worked in two ways one uh, revenue and two law and order very oppressive systems both of these law and order control of riots arresting torturing indian uh, protesters you know freedom fighters revenue collecting revenue even when there's drought in even when there's famine uh, enforcing uh, very abusive revenue codes uh, and forcing our uh, cultivators to you know grow different crops from what is actually naturally in their region enforcing forest laws arresting tribes uh, harassing tribes so they did everything abusive in the name of revenue collection and to stabilize law and order so when this happened uh, but but you know uh, how did this administration help us like how did having a modern civil services during british time help us 
you will read it in modern india okay so did you read that it united india uh in the chapter i think on uh, what were the forces for nationalism in 19 like 1905 1910 period so that's where we read that modern administration has been a factor for unifying india so there is one united administration which thinks similarly which talks similarly which works on same rules and principles across india so even for person in delhi or for person in madras it's the same administration which has been abusing and working in a similar manner so that is also a factor which which was uh, you know which made it possible for the growth of nationalism in the country and uh, that's how it united the entire country onto one line it's it's a phenomenal feat so wherever you go across india they could feel british and through rules and through proper uh, meritorious system which is a great achievement but at the same time it has also shown how a machine that is created for british interests can harm india right so that is why post independence like immediately after we got independence patel and nehru had a discussion nehru wanted to dissolve civil services nehru believed that a civil services which could harm its people so some of the civil servants are indians so such a system which could harm its own people which it is serving is not conducive for india post independence because india at the time of independence is a poor nation india was suffering two centuries of lack of freedom and for the first time these people are having freedom they are aiming to get out of poverty they are aiming to create their own vision of the future and it it rapidly needs development so for such an india which is trying to get out of slavery this kind of system which is conducive to enforcing slavery and to enforcing power on people is not exactly suitable so nehru wanted to dissolve this civil services he felt that it does not suit a democratic india but patel strongly felt that the same system if you infuse a new set of principles please infuse a new set of values i am sure it can serve india because it has stood united largely even uh, during uh, the peaks of freedom struggle so the capacity of administration administration to stand united to work on same set of principles and in fact while india is just bringing back all the princely states into indian union uh civil servants have been helpful so they have the knowledge of local systems they have the aptitude you are only speaking of uh, values right so let's just infuse a new set of values and i'm sure they can work for people and for upholding indian democracy and to work towards indian development this is what patel believed so what do you think we like who is correct so we ultimately got our civil services civil says it stood the test of time it's still standing up right now what do you think uh, what is your assessment of contemporary civil services in the light of this debate ma'am patel sardar patel was right, was right here as he said that it is a steel frame for a good governance of india and it was necessary at that time because uh today also we see that politician uh, do anything by their own like uh, ad- administrator are there civil servant are there but they don't listen to them or if we were not having that time this uh, bureaucracy then the reform like uh, industrialization the pc mal and of this like this uh, persons were there because of whom our economy started from very narrow base and today we are 
at like very uh, like firm base because of them only this is okay. what i think okay any other views and one more view ma'am uh, let's uh, assume our today's condition like uh, economy is not going well hello ma'am are you there yeah yeah i'm here economy is not going well and there is opportunity today also like we have raguram rajan then abhijit uh, abhijit uh, banerjee right uh, we can call them we can make panel of, out of them like very we have very meritorious economists we can make panel of them we can take suggestion from them but our political like government system is not accepting that thing they don't don't want such people in our country so the blame is with the politicians okay sindhu anjana okay so you're right so ankar uh, i agree to the extent that bureaucracy has been able to uphold a democracy you know by conducting elections by uh, you know by contributing technically to india's development it has contributed phenomenally well uh, but but see uh what what i would like to take you to is the need for civil services in india so where do we need civil services it's not ki so is it is it that you need civil services to conduct elections you no know, you maybe you can have uh, an electoral machinery just which comes in conduct elections and go so do we have civil services to just uh, maybe implement schemes for that if if it is just about identifying beneficiaries uh, allotting funds through you know into their schemes then you can have uh, robots there but why do you need civil services um your famous example tn session like we have machinery we can do it exactly but for uh, leader reform for leadership and vision that's why we need thinking people in the system right so not people who just conduct elections not just people who implement schemes but people who have a vision for the country next people who live the spirit of this country what is the spirit of this country like who actually feel what liberty is who don't just say i uphold constitution liberty justice equality fraternity no but what is liberty in its truest spirit so when one activist is protesting or questioning you you can understand that the question is coming from their uh, their responsibility to uphold their duty and at the same time it is your responsibility to let them participate and question so that is the spirit of democracy so and what is the spirit of development that is needed for india for us development is not just about implementing schemes efficiently but it is also to bring in equity through the implementation of schemes to bring in justice through the implementation of schemes to ensure that girls are receiving as much benefit as boys in schools so these are the principles that are const- that our civil services should always be mindful of when we say that constitution is the guiding document for civil servants it is not the text of the constitution it is the spirit of the constitution but if you look at the way civil servants have been working they have been largely centralizing in nature if you uh, if you name the three most progressive legislations in india one rti two uh, we can say 73rd 74th amendment acts panchayat raj and urban local government and then three lokpal so lokpal has stopped uh, because of political class and rti panchayat raj urban local government both are colossal failures because of bureaucracy 
so this is not what i am saying but this is what arc is saying this is what time and again reports have been saying so when it comes to rti um, the persons who are appointed to administer rti are bureaucrats bureaucrats are very very conservative in really you know releasing information that is with the system they are always scared of the outcomes if they reveal certain information how will i be you know put into or dragged into all of this so civil servants block rti information they give very vague information even if you ask a question in an rti the information they give is very vague that you cannot act on that information it is not giving you information in the sense of information it's only a you know text that they paste and send it it's unactionable useless if you look at panchayat raj institutions and urban local bodies and the people who have blocked the efficiency of ulbs of, you know of course the political class did not dissolve sorry devolve the funds and functionaries and functions that are needed but even within the functions that are given to local bodies and even within the funds that are given to local bodies the district collector holds so much influence they do not release funds to gram sabhas on time and the block development officer at mandal level he is he or she is an officer and these persons do not allow the gram sabha to function on their own so again it is the bureaucracy which is stopping grassroots democracy from taking place and if you look at any other reform in india you name make in india you look at our uh, you know trade ties with uh, you know southeast asian countries so in our trade what is stopping us again a bureaucracy bureaucracy is reluctant to take decisions and to push things forward so that is why whenever you look at uh, india's deals with southeast asian countries the biggest thing is we never deliver projects on time make in india it's a colossal failure because we could not clear files on time so our incapacity to take decisions has been harming india's development our incapacity to devolve power and let go of power has been hurting indian democracy and the elite mentality that bureaucracy bureaucracy holds we call it the colonial mentality still considers power in their own hands so bureaucracy very rarely speaks and interacts to people it largely behaves as uh the machine of the government in time so it does not work for people it works for government so it works to ensure whatever the government says is delivered not whatever people ask is delivered so it has been largely colonial and second arc calls that bureaucracy lives in an ivory tower which is detached from the realities of people they bring in schemes which even people cannot understand so uh, you know Uh, i think uh, some bureaucrats if you if you look at the things that bureaucrats do they'll be given some 100 crore the moment they become commissioner of let's say hyderabad uh, city what should be the priority if you become commissioner of hyderabad city every year hyderabad has this dengue and malaria pandemics between august and uh, october so maybe you can take that up as a priority task clean up all the lakes by the time of monsoon so it's very easy it's common sense by the time of monsoon you clean up lakes and during monsoon they get uh, filled but uh, you just don't act before monsoon and during monsoon it becomes a mess and there's outburst of uh, mosquito larvae and diseases it's it's an annual ritual that happens no commission has been able to solve it and you know what where they invest funds on they invested funds on beautification of a flyover so there's there are like too many flyovers in hyderabad and each flyover is beautified like you have very fancy lights and very fancy colors along it so yesterday last night we were coming up late in the night and then there is a there is a huge floral decoration beside a flyover i you know i can send the pictures of that i cannot imagine how on earth they spent money on it so all these are in the limits and ambits of a bureaucrat and why are bureaucrats unable to solve fundamental problems as dengue so you know healthcare is not in your domain as the commissioner of a city but definitely preventing actively proactively preventing dengue is in your hands take it up as a priority task and solve the problem you can solve traffic problem if you dedicate 2 years of your service just to enforcing traffic regulations 
so the bureaucracy does not have leadership it does not have vision and it is just lost in day to day knee jerk reactions that nothing tangible is happening you you just look at cities and the way they are governed it's it's just out of control and why are they out of control you look at our villages and how people are migrating out of villages it has collapsed so where is a civil servant acting then so civil servants are people who need to have that vision to customize the rules and regulations schemes and programs of government to the immediate needs of people in that location to uphold people's participation to ask people to come up with their set of problems and to solve their problems proactively if a civil servant is not able to deliver any of these how can i call civil services a success civil servants have been successful to maintain civil servants i know civil services as a job you know in any other country by now civil services would have been reformed like hell because they it is a colossal failure the system is a failure so you you go to any district and track the activity of a civil servant and tell me which problem they are able to solve very few collectors have been able to solve problems at a systems level not at the level of awareness awareness anyone can do why should a civil servant just invest time and money on creating awareness they should create systems they should solve problems they should create systems e sridharan created systems that could be replicated across india it even when now you construct metro in kochi or the metro you construct a metro in uh, hyderabad uh, e sridharan's prof, you know model of metro construction is seen in applied paramayar paramayar has developed this system for swachh bharat abhiyan that could be replicated across india so we need civil servants like that in nook and corner of the country and not just one or two civil servants these civil servants should actually delegate leadership to multiple second level uh, leaders and then to third level leaders so that's that's how efficient uh, you know program delivery or efficient development can happen and we failed in it you look at the extent of reforms that happened in west in civil services you cannot even fathom the uh, such changes in india so civil services have been largely successful to maintain its position in maintaining its position thanks to this government now we are speaking of lateral entry there is no competition in the system there is an incentive to change your style of work there is an incentive to perform now because people are coming they are competing with you so uh, and this government has uh, broken down services it is now saying that uh, there is ex- there is going to be an extreme you know exclusively railway service right so soon you may have a separate exam for police service for administrative service so as you as you specialize your civil services because the country is specializing our economy needs specialists of course i you know in the debate between generalists and specialists i still believe that we need generalists who can bind several specialists together so imagine a district you will have an economist you will have a statistician you will have a healthcare specialist you will have uh, in a de- education officer you need this district collector who is the generalist who can think in calm and sensical terms to unite all these ideas and build a vision for district they should be the generalists i agree but these generalists should have knowledge either knowledge or attitude you should have attitude to invite suggestions from these specialists apply those learnings to your vision of the district so this is the contemporary state of civil services in india there is lots of agony in people against civil servants because no civil servant can be seen in terms of ownership by people people can't do own civil services up they still behaving like bosses kings or queens so they are largely away from common people they cannot understand common people's attitudes they are not devolving power there might be changes in a few pockets of change and these are case studies for you to write few civil servants are actually enforcing mandates of gram sabha 
few civil servants are going beyond calls of duty and uh, and asking activists to participate in governance so telangana women development secretary actually invites ngos proactively to come and join in uh, you know in, in governance for women empowerment so such steps are happening and these people are agents of change so when you quote examples of civil servants please quote civil servants who are actually bringing systemic changes not just a civil servant uh, who paints walls creatively or who um or who for that matter um i i i don't know if i can share this example but there's um there's a civil servant who just went and sat with a old woman on you know in the collectorate building and it became a big news next day so if the collector you know it's good the collector is warm but that's not enough from civil services because you have immense duty right so along with love and warmth breaking down that colonial mentality along with that also building in systems it's not enough if civil servants are good with social media uh, and just branding themselves but in building institutions so that's where i really wish civil service is contributing something uh, to the country yeah shivankar i'll i'm just reading yes, yeah please there please. was one in, one instance like uh, i will tell about the attitude only now you told that uh, when i went to caste validity certificate office in pune uh, there were many poor people like coming from 200 km or 100 km they stay there in that campus only uh, when they want to take this caste validity certificate and one man had uh, came there for six or seven times they were rejecting for minor documents and that day uh, he told that front desk people that i uh, i will wait till night but i will but i want the certificate then they called the uh, head in like who was the head civil servant there then he said what what is your issue and that man told that uh, i want certificate i am here for six or seven times but i am not getting it i will take it by tonight then he told him just wait and at i think 8 pm he called him and he is asking him just uh, bring out your uh, grandfather's uh, fathers like his uh, grandfather's uncle's uh, living certificate or any document then you will get this thing like their their attitude is not for serving the people like they are creating more complication and at last he is saying now let's see how you get uh, this uh, certificate and all and their like civil servant their team was uh, laughing saying Oh, uh, and other men were also telling you why you said this thing to officer now he will not give anything to you like such attitude is there and how will the system will function yeah many are like that so like even we have been facing a challenge so my dad uh, applies for medical uh, you know rep- a uh, refund from the state because he is state government employee and uh, his file has been stuck for 18 months now so for, he didn't like he takes his chemotherapy and um the cost of the medicine is huge and the refund is just stuck for 18 months so we try to reach out through multiple channels there is no online portal there is no rti Uh, because you have to literally file rti and go submit it uh, we are in hyderabad we couldn't go there we, ca- we could not follow up so it's 18 months now and still there's no update um maybe we maybe we'll be going there next week moving back to our hometown so i wish something <laughs> we could do something about it uh, we plan to file an rti but look at it like i mean 18 months and the cost is huge for a middle class family to bear so so what is the impact of bureaucratic delay here the impact of bureaucratic delay is not just efficiency or lack of investment 
but it is the human capital so you are losing so there's so much opportunity cost maybe the uh, no the family could invest the money that has uh, been um, sent back in reimbursement on something else uh, they could have invested on something else for their uh, future their for their security for their financial security but the opportunity cost of these delays is humongous not just in terms of investment usually we speak of uh, bureaucratic delays in terms of investment delay uh, in, impact on investment ease of doing business it's not just about doing business but it's about living ease of living we cannot live happily if bureaucracy does not work efficiently so uh, you you want to go collect like uh, shubhankar point or you want to go collect a certificate or you want to uh, just apply for a change of address it, it at least needs to your four visits no thankfully uh, there is this move towards e governance many bureaucrats are tech savvy um, engineers are coming into the system so there's kind of shift in the attitude people want to work for outcomes there's more focus on outcomes today um, largely thankfully uh, but it needs a huge shift in attitudes to actually deliver the services that a bureaucrat should be delivering so this is the status of public administration currently where do we stand with public administration this is it. so we evolved all the all the way from an administration which is serving monarchy and upholding king to a system which has to actually uphold people's mandate what people want now in such a scenario where you have your duty is to uphold what people want what ethics should guide you in public administration so now we know the role of public administration right so your role is to uphold constitutional values to actually work for development of all of all sections of people to ensure that power is decentralized and systems are built so these are the roles so to implement government mandate and involve people in it so these are the duties of civil services so in performing such duties what ethics should a civil servant possess or what ethics should civil services possess as a system what ethics should guide the system you can name a few yeah courage empathy right honesty impartiality like uh, i have read this in book uh, traditional one and a uh, new uh, are there new set of uh, this ethics like innovation and uh, uh, competition team spirit efficiency and uh, effectiveness dedication yeah yeah objectivity transparency is also important Yes, all these are principles. Leadership, right? Being selfless, ah, uh, always ensuring holding public interest. So these are all ethics in public administration. So the challenge 
to uphold ethics in public administration is there is no one way to define public interest we discussed this already right so what is right for public is a big question so you should try and see if the decision you are taking is aligning to any of these principles so in the case like uh, shubhankar was sharing maybe the person who wants that document is not qualified under scheme let's just imagine but his situation and the urgency of his uh, condition may ask for some extra empathy from civil servant to solve the problem quickly so there you are uh, your ethic is not just efficiency in implementing rules your ethic is also empathy so empathy also guides you to make the right choice for example you are uh, you got a secret information and uh, it is highly secretive in nature you cannot reveal it but an rta is filed whether you should reveal it or not should you go for transparency and reveal the information or should you uphold the information in larger public interest because you reveal the information maybe it can do more harm than it can do good so it is never easy to determine what is right in public administration that is why we only have a code of ethics india does not have code of ethics also second year see recommends to have a code of ethics but this code of ethics is recommended because rules or laws always cannot guide you in deciding what is right like i just mentioned if you go by rules or laws sometimes you might eliminate few necessary beneficiaries uh and uh, you might delay a process that has actually that actually needs speed so rules or laws cannot act as guide for ethics because we already read the difference between laws and ethics right law can never catch up with ethics ethics is very fast paced ethics is thinking of good ethics is never punishing ethics is more voluntary in nature but rules and laws are very rigid they try to catch up with ethics they are very slow in adapting so when the attitude of society or when the ethics of society towards lgbtq has changed that's when law caught up with it so law is always behind ethics very rarely can law lead the ethics of society very rarely so rules and laws cannot be a source of ethics they can complement ethics same is the case with uh, uh you know institutions so just because you have rti just because you have lokpal it does not mean people do right so we have a legislation called prevention of corruption act are bribes still there in india is bribery still prevalent yes ma'am yeah yeah so we have corruption we It's have very LGBTQ. innovative yeah even if it is lgbtq i don't think the attitude has really changed it's just we have a law now that it is okay but people are still largely the same yeah 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 i totally agree one section of people totally against it like i don't think we can ever change them but a the large, demand large, for a large section of people are totally against it right? large I section i totally agree large section of people are behind it uh, behind the legislation <clears throat> but the idea for legislation or, for, or the demand for legislation has come from people isn't it from at least a section of people yes yes, yes. so which have led the protest or the need for the change in law so if that section of people is not there the law wouldn't have come so as you know always i think change makers are very few always it, it has always been the case with history so only one man raja ramohan roy and sati only one man ishwar chand vidya sagar and vidori marriage so one or two people will be system, you know agents of change but it comes from people it doesn't come from law it comes from society change comes from ethics uh, in the society and then it goes into law and then it creates a larger ripple effect uh, that's how we can imagine it to work 
um but uh, coming back to prevention of corruption act though we have pca we have very innovative ways of doing corruption today in the society so pca could not stop corruption from happening so given these conditions we think that a code of ethics might help in choosing what is the right thing to do prevention of corruption act cannot help you in case you are forced into corruption so let's just imagine your boss has given an order for you to sign like you are mandated to sign it so if at all you receive a file noting from your senior as per hierarchy rules you have to sign it so they they have listed something they have chosen the person based on a very wrong and narrow system you know that but legally as per rules and as per your institutional codes you have to sign it what would you do would you sign it because your it is your boss order or would you sign it because you have to uphold public interest because it's public's money at stake ma'am uh, as you told now there is file noting uh, we have to sign it because it is a uh, hierarchical process we will sign but the file noting is the most important thing uh, which through which we can uh, uphold the public interest how are you upholding public interest you are signing it and it is corrupt how are you upholding public interest you are only securing yourself uh, then if we are not signing then uh, we then have you to are, you are only taking threat so the, so the even file, if you yeah the file should not be signed and the i mean and the person who who is in the place to sign he has to give a detailed description like why he is not signing the file it might help yeah exactly at least that closely comes up i would say not even detailed because this person already gave you a file noting this person has already chosen the, the entire process is uh, skewed to select one person for a particular project so everything is out there clearly and maybe yeah so you can write a report and say that i'm not signing it but shubhanka coming back to you um in in signing it or in not signing it you are only upholding your interest how are you upholding public interest you are only thinking of yourself you are securing yourself uh, got i got it now man what right? you were saying yeah so so when we say that okay i have signed because there is file noting it's all out in the public how is it out in the public the damage is happening if you sign it so you should not sign it so maybe 100 crore money will just go out of the system like that and you know it you are not doing anything because okay file noting if at all tomorrow someone comes and checks it is already written so i am safe no why are you th- thinking of tomorrow and you becoming safe right now at this moment 100 crore is gone and you know our system how long it takes for us to punish an ias officer you can never punish them and for you to reject it so why are you scared of rejecting you you should always reject an unjust order so uh, that is why civil services is a very difficult job each civil servant though they are following hierarchy they know that the moment they receive an unjust order from superior they are rejecting it they can reject it you have that discretion and you should enforce that discretion that is why there is a demand for code of ethics it's not enough if you have rules laws and institutions and procedures in place there is need for code of ethics which can guide the system to choose what is right so in this case what is right could be so what are our principles here so honesty yeah honesty is your guiding principle you just being truthful in that situation you being selfless in that situation you are upholding transparency in that situation you are upholding competition fair competition because if you are just giving tender to someone who is 
coming through a uh, coming through a nepotistic process then you are dissolving competition so you should uphold competition and innovation and being impartial so these principles should guide decisions in public administration and that is why there is need for a code of ethics which helps civil servants decide what is right especially in situations when there is an ethical dilemma so ethical dilemma is a situation where there are two possible outcomes in a particular case two values are conflicting value one value two or two possible outcomes are conflicting two possible paths are conflicting or two possible outcomes are conflicting that is an ethical dilemma which principle to apply to resolve that situation so there is a situation and you can apply principle 1 you can apply principle 2 and it might have two different outcomes altogether what are you going to choose so in such situations law may not be your best friend rules may not be your best friend institutions or hierarchy may not be your best friend code of ethics could be your best friend it can help you decide what is right because it gives some principles it does not just give some rules like always speak truth what is truth in that situation it's very difficult so always uh, sign the order given by your senior how can you sign it you know it is wrong always uh, report a complaint to you know when the when something wrong is happening always write a complaint you you don't know whether you know so you're sure whether this uh, you know that this complaint sorry this action is wrong but you don't know if the complaint can actually stop this action from happening so rules laws or procedures may not always help you take actions quickly so that's why you need a code of ethics if, which if ingrained in your body can speed up decision making like i have given the example of uh, this officer from maharashtra who has funded the expedition to mount everest so it is not written anywhere if you look at it in fact she has broken rules because she has appropriated funds from one program into another but did she do the right thing is it ethical we discussed yeah yeah, right? yeah so she displayed lots of empathy to create that role model for the community and in fact it has humongous effect so from now on if at all they implement any tribal welfare programs people will be more receptive because their identity got a boost so determining what is right in civil services or in public administration is a very difficult thing that is why you need a code of ethics which can help you decide what is right beyond just rules laws and institutional procedures and just going a step forward and identifying what are the challenges that are public administration challenges to ethics in public administration what challenges do we have now so we discussed why ethics why do we need some ethics in public administration but to uphold such ethics what challenges do we have from the rules or hierarchy that is there also centralization we can classify these challenges as maybe internal to bureaucracy and external to bureaucracy right the yeah. hierarchy centralization what else i think as a person if they lack the connection or if they don't have those particular set of values again that will be difficult yeah civil service values such as impersonal nature 
and still the colonial attitude. What else? Ma'am, uh, lack of intent to serve. We don't know about intent, but we can say that attitude has been colonial in nature, right? So can we comment on intent? Because you never know intent. But what is seen, we can comment on. It is seen to be colonial. The attitudes are seen to be colonial. To that extent, we can comment. Shall we also say, yeah, weak legal machinery to uphold ethics? So you have Prevention of Corruption Act, but the punishments under Prevention of Corruption Act do not happen at the pace they have to happen. We have Lokpal, but Lokpal is not appointed. Yes, you want to Political, politician and businessman. Yes. Politicization of bureaucracy. So the impact of politician. Next. Also cash, cash economy. Hmm. So we can say corruption. And nature of economy. Yeah. Uh, even the social condition. Yes. Social because, factors. Uh, now that we have to speak about some uh, people who have actually done it, they are very rare. We, are, we have to think and search of one or two people who have done things. So, and uh, the people, if you ask the previous generation people, especially now also they are telling, this is how civil services are supposed to be. The collector is like a demigod, things like that. So societal conditioning also plays a role. Uh, yes. Weak protection to whistleblower. In fact, we can write that in weak legal machinery itself. There is no protection to whistleblowers. Poor enforcement of uh, Prevention of Corruption Act. Can we also say historical factors? So it is said that by bribery became an attitude in India uh, post-colonial uh, uh, rule. So during British, bribes were seen as an incentive to make civil servants function for the for the British in India. So historical factors are also a reason. And uh, institutional setup itself of bureaucracy. So it, it should be written here. So institutional setup of bureaucracy where our transfers, promotions uh, are totally arbitrary. Punishments instead of rewards for doing the right thing. Huh, there are no rewards, right? They, and rewards. there are punishments for transfer and things. No, we don't yeah. want rewards, but there are punishments, uh, we can say. So. Yeah, there are punishments. You're saying? If people are transferring, yeah, they are transferred. If they do something right, then they are transferred or they are, you know, there are a lot of things happening. Okay, when they do good. I am just surprised, yeah. okay. When are we having transfer as a punishment? <laughs> For doing something wrong. That's it's... What, that's, no, that's what I mean. Not for doing wrong, no. for doing the right thing. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we exactly. Need to do rewards, but there are punishments. So that is. Yes. So that Maharashtra that IAS officer. Anybody, that won't encourage anybody to do it. That will, in fact, sometimes uh, even discourage people if they are not, their conviction is not strong enough. They would not want to do it. They would want to be safe. Exactly. That's what is happening. There's no risk taking now. The Maharashtra is obviously she is on a punishment transfer now, like right now. Um, so th that's the that's the scene, you know, in India. Uh, Many so people have advised me not to go for uh, civil services. Actually, people tell for your attitude, uh, you don't please don't go. You might be transferred every other month. Please don't. Go. So. Ma'am, there is like a, a kind of universal statement in Maharashtra, like every politician or they say to civil servant that if you if you will not listen to us then you will get transferred to Gadchiroli. <laughs> it is near to Andhra Pradesh only. Like uh, northeast uh, southeast LW affected, right? Uh, yes. Sir. In fact for such offices I think it would be an opportunity only. They will at least do something good. Sincere officers would at least do something good in Axel affected areas. Yeah, so these are all the challenges to ethics in public administration. 
so you so far studied what like what is the state of public administration now uh, why we need ethics in public administration why why can't laws or rules guide us to decide what is right thing to do in administration uh, we have this we have discussed what ethics we actually need when it comes to public administration and now we are seeing what are the challenges to ethics in public administration so i think this uh, with this we are done with all the topics in ethics in public administration today we'll be sharing you the yeah yeah i'll discuss few minutes yeah one more point when it comes to challenges in uh, challenges to ethics in public administration is the lack of diversity within the system let me show you some stunning figures so let me just share my screen so secretaries in the government just three sts one dalit and no obc this is the diversity of our secretaries and of 88 secretary rank officers in central government only 11 are women at state and ut level only one out of 32 chief secretaries is a women now if you look at cabinet secretary level there is no women cabinet secretary in india so far you can so among the new recruits only 5% new civil servants uh let's just yeah this one recently talk of upsc jihad i'll show you one more on secretaries ma'am there was a report of national commission of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes i don't know mm-hmm. exactly the year but uh, the fact was uh, in uh, central public uh, sector enterprises only 8.4% of a grade officers uh, belong to scheduled caste when the figure should be at least 15% exactly so that's the case. yeah that's the case when there is no representation how can you uphold ethics in public administration so all sections of society itself are not represented and even within ocs or like a uh, few castes the the rep, like in in secretaries it's again the people who wield so much family influence who who have lots of income who have political influence already so our civil services itself as a system has been largely un, you know non inclusive it it has been very discriminatory and it has it has skewed to, towards few sections so that is where we stand as a system uh, our public administration now the challenges uh, like in the challenges to uphold uh, you know ethics in public administration we can also say that having too many rules and laws is creating a challenge too many rules so we call it a legal jungle in india uh so you name one act let's say setting up a small factory you might have to uh you know fulfill 40 50 you know the provisions under 40 50 rules or laws and then you can become your factory can become illegal under any of these law and then 
a bureaucrat comes and then you have to uh, please that bureaucrat to get permits or licenses so when there are too many rules or legislations upholding what is right and is difficult at the same time there is too much discretion in the hands of few people to decide what is right again ethics suffer so that is how upholding ethics in public administration has become a challenge now what do you do to to create more ethical systems so that's where second arc suggests a slew of reforms so from institutional reforms to legal to setting up some procedures to involving citizens in governance or bringing in ethics second arc suggests several steps lots of steps so we'll sh- like uh, we'll share all the arc like uh, second arc ethics in governance nicely highlighted i have highlighted all the uh, pages and whichever concepts you have to read you can just directly go to those concepts just read those pages and you are done so the suggestions to uphold ethics in administration are given by second arc and the very exhaustive you can just rely on the document uh, and get a grip of it so that should take care of ethics in public administration right and that's it in the next session on probity in governance along with the mechanisms to uphold uh, ethics we'll also discuss the uh, ethics in environment corporate ethics so we'll discuss them along with probity just a minute yes so we'll discuss them along with probity uh, as to how to uphold ethics in international relations environmental ethics ethics in economy these are all little miscellaneous uh, things corporate governance okay um that's it for ethics in puppet did you all solve the journals i went through it i'll follow it and post it sorry any doubts there anjana in the journal i'm i'm just going through like did you post on the channel no no i i just went through it i will post it today i'll finish it and post it today oh, okay okay so yes, anyone else I did, I did, I yeah yeah the previous one not this one the previous one my question okay civil service values ka yeah, yeah yes okay yeah i just saw it done i'll be giving feedback on that meanwhile you can post ethics in bombay so anyone I'm else testing. saw journal I'm and have sorry the test paper we when will we be i posted test paper uh, check copies uh, yesterday only, only two papers right yeah mine was not posted i had uploaded it oh. uh, i didn't i i didn't even see your side no, down i on. shubhankar in front i posted it after shubhang research but i think the second day after the test yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i think i missed the next day to me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i'll i'll send it today itself yeah That's i just I thought that. i'll remind you i thought you might have missed it because you had yeah. posted the next one also so i thought maybe you yes yes i missed I, i think i missed nickels also i'm just seeing nickels maybe i copied it sometime and i later in check okay sindhu also posted done done i I'll, i'll send it after that okay so with the journal we solved the journal on ethics in pubad because it's like we crafted it very well for you to understand how to uphold ethics in pa so solve that and post back so that i can give feedback on slack itself okay okay ma'am okay okay then bye bye okay. have a good day bye bye